What tools do anthropologists use to understand how religion works? In this section, I want to look at a number of influential thinkers and theories about religion. These theories have heavily influenced the way anthropologists approach the study of religion. In particular, they provided insight into the way religion interacts with material culture, social and economic systems, power, and systems of meaning. Let's go back to Emile Durkheim, the French sociologist we've seen before. One of Durkheim's most influential books was The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. In this book, Durkheim explored the relation between religion and society. He argued that the most basic form of religion was practiced by Australian Aborigines who lived in small, isolated foraging bands at the time Europeans showed up in the 18th century. In an attempt to define religion, Durkheim focused on the opposing concepts of sacred and profane. By sacred, he meant those practices, people, or objects that are considered holy or set apart by a religion. The term profane was used to refer to ordinary practices, people, or objects. In short, that which was not set apart. He defined religion as a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. Durkheim also underlined the importance of ritual in religion. He argued that ritual brought people together to create society and strengthen social bonds. As he saw it, society itself is generated in the warmth of heightened social contact the collective emotion, the bubbling over or effervescence. This energy produced by collective ritual thus served to bind society together. Following Durkheim's lead, many anthropologists have focused on studying rituals. As religions are full of rituals and symbolic practice, this has been a very rich field of study. What kinds of religious rituals are you familiar with? Attending services, daily prayers, the lighting of candles in memory of people, Christian communion, fasting, etc. Do you practice any religious rituals? Karl Marx, whose primary interest was on class struggle, inequality, and the ravages of capitalism, called religion the opiate of the masses. As we discussed earlier, Marx was interested in the division between the proletariat, the workers, and the bourgeoisie, those who own the means of production. Marx viewed religion within the framework of his views on economy and society from a materialist perspective. He noted that religious devotion tended to be higher among the proletariat rather than the bourgeoisie. And so religion, as a response to economic relations, are what he called relations of production. Relations of production made the proletariat poor and defenseless. They needed religion as a balm to soothe their rough lives. Or as he put it again, religion is the opiate of the masses. By this, he meant that religion served to dull the pain of a life among the proletariat. Do you agree with Marx that religion's purpose is to dull the pain of everyday life and to uphold an unequal economic system? Now let's turn back to Max Weber, who we also discussed in an earlier presentation on class and social inequality. Weber wrote at length on the social and cultural history of religion. Perhaps his most famous book is A Protestant Ethic in the Spirit of Capitalism. The question he sought to address in this book was, how did the Protestant Reformation contribute to the rise of capitalism? This is a very different approach from Marx. For Marx, the, the economy drove religion. For Weber, on the other hand, religion could exert powerful influence on the economy. Specifically, Weber was interested in the rise and development of capitalism in 19th century Europe. In the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, Weber argued that it was European religion that allowed capitalism to thrive. 
Specifically, Weber identified the strong work ethic and the high value placed on thrift and discipline among many Protestant religious groups. These hard-working, thrifty Protestants could not spend their money on idle pursuits, so they saved it. Their worldly success through hard work because of the Protestant work ethic made them wealthy. The money they saved was deposited in banks where it became the capital needed to ignite the Industrial Revolution and the rise of capitalism. Weber, however, worried that the success of capitalism would increase the rate of cultural secularism, that is, the abandonment of religion, and in the end would undermine the success of capitalism itself. <clears throat> Weber also wrote on shamanism, which he classified as an early stage of religion. Shamanistic religions are focused around individual religious practitioners known as shamans. Shamans have a special and personal connection with supernatural powers or beings. This ability is typically activated through a shamanic trance. Trances are created by a variety of means, including meditation, fasting, and on occasion the ingestion of a variety of substances, sometimes hallucination-inducing substances. In a trance, shamans can petition the supernatural powers for the benefit of their people. The process of becoming a shaman has also been of great interest to anthropologists. Shamans typically undergo a variety of initiation rites or trials. During the course of these trials, they make contact with the divine, and then the divine guides them right in their shamanistic practice. Different varieties of shamanism have been observed in numerous cultures around the world. Anthropologist Laurel Kendall studied women shamans in rural South Korea. These women called upon local gods and deceased ancestors on behalf of other women in the community who were seeking assistance with everyday problems such as injuries or illness, troublesome children, a drunken husband, or economic struggles. Once the supernatural powers were channeled by shamanistic trances, they would seek to advise or console the women in need of support. We touched briefly on magic in the last module. Let's return to it here to explore the relationship between religion and magic. Magic is a form of power. Recall that power is the ability to bring about change through action or influence. We can think of magic as the ability to bring change through supernatural action or supernatural influence. How this supernatural power is used or wielded varies drastically among different cultures, but power is a primary topic. Many anthropologists have studied magic over the years. We'll look at three prominent examples. E. E. Evans Pritchard made a major contribution to rethinking the logic of magic and witchcraft. We've already looked at the work of Evans Pritchard among the Nur in Sudan. This time, we want to look at his work with the Azande of Central Africa. In witchcraft, oracles, and magic among the Azande, Evans Pritchard sought to overturn ethnocentric Western concepts about magic and witchcraft. That is, he sought to challenge the idea that magic was an irrational act practiced by simple-minded natives. Evans Pritchard argued instead that magic and witchcraft only appear inconsistent and irrational when they're examined outside the context of daily life. Among the Azande, virtually all misfortunes in life were traced back to witchcraft. If you were ill, it was caused by witchcraft. If someone died, witchcraft, and so on. Interestingly, witchcraft could be caused by people without their knowing it. It was considered to be inherited from a parent and could be carried out unconsciously. No spells or incantations were involved, but all misfortunes were caused by it, and many people could be perpetrating it without even knowing that they were doing so. Magic, on the other hand, was a deliberate act among the Azande. Magic was consciously performed through incantations and spells 
by trained witch doctors, a Western term if ever there was one. The witch doctor's primary purpose was to counteract the misfortune created by witchcraft. Using their magic, witch doctors attempted to, justif to identify the source of misfortune and then ask that person to stop performing witchcraft. One of the, one of the functions of these practices was to allow for the resolution of conflict and enable people to live together. Evans Pritchard's work among the Azande was groundbreaking for anthropological studies of magic and witchcraft and highly influential in its cultural relativism. It became a cornerstone of modern anthropology. As a second African example, we can turn to the work of anthropologist Paul Stoller. His book, In Sorcery Shadow, relates his experiences in the West African country of Niger. After spending time in local communities and learning the Songhai language, Stoller was invited to become an apprentice to a local sorcerer. As part of that experience, he lived the life of a traditional magic practitioner. He had to memorize incantations. He had to eat special foods required as part of the initiation. He ingested powders and wore magical objects for protection. In short, he took the concept of participant observation to its fullest extent. Stoller claims to have indirectly participated in a sorcery attack that resulted in the temporary paralysis of the victim. He also reported that a powerful village sorceress attacked him with spirits which caused him to experience debilitating physical effects. After this event, he left the field rapidly and returned home. Through his experiences, Stoller began to question the doubts he had about the reality of sorcery. In short, he was pulled in to the cultural logic of sorcery in Songhai society. Recall that at the beginning of this presentation, we cited Ken Guest, who noted that anthropologists understand that religious worlds are real, meaningful, and powerful to those who live in them. Again, our purpose is not to judge a religion or a magic act or sorcery as real or unreal, but instead to understand how it is real to the person who experiences it. Turning to our own society, let's look at George Gmelch's account of baseball magic. Gmelch studied how professional baseball players in the U.S. also resort to magic. Baseball players are notorious for their superstitious beliefs. If they win three games without washing their socks, they'll never wash those socks again. If a pitcher touched the bill of his cap before throwing a pitch the last time he struck out a batter, then he'll keep touching the bill of his cap before every pitch. A cultural pattern of beliefs has developed among these athletes that favors the use of repetitive acts with the belief that they will bring about a desired outcome. You may think that these are just little superstitions and do not amount to magic. But we define magic as the ability to bring about change through supernatural action or supernatural influence. Baseball players carry out these acts of repetitive magic with the specific intent of trying to make a change through these actions. Thus, magic is alive and well in the modern United States and is practiced by culturally prominent individuals. In closing, Let's try to define witchcraft and sorcery. Witchcraft is a power inherent in certain individuals that permits them, without the use of magical charms or other paraphernalia, to do harm or cause misfortune to others. Sorcery is a technique of using magical paraphernalia, materials, actions, or words to harness supernatural powers ordinarily to achieve evil ends. But note, witchcraft and sorcery are not always necessarily evil. Power can be used for a variety of ends, including protection and healing. I like to think of witchcraft and sorcery as a loaded gun. Right? It can protect you. It can harm others. It can even harm yourself. Anthropologists seek to understand 
the cultural logic and meaning of religious practices and religious systems, including magical practices, witchcraft, and sorcery.